Climate gate set to break wide open. New developments today involving those hacked emails from Britain suggesting scientists are fudging data to make their case for global warming. A potentially major scandal is unfolding after someone released thousands of emails and documents sent between prominent scientists of global warming debate. Ever since the release of stolen emails from one of the world's most important climate centers, they've been the pedantic preoccupation of compulsive cranks, obsessive oddballs, and Fox News. Sorry, I'm repeating myself. Number three, a little more, more complex, but listen to this. I've just completed Mike's nature, uh, Mike's nature trick of adding in the real temps for e to each series for the last 20 years, i.e. from 1981 onwards, and from 1961 for Keith to hide the decline. A lot of the comments seem to center around the use of the word trick, but it's really not all that sinister. Here's another trick to impress your friends. Home fries, hash browns, even potato pancakes, chip, chop, slice or dice. No doubt Phil Jones, the scientist who wrote the email, would use a different wording if he'd known who his audience would be. To be fair, trick is a loaded word for climate deniers, many of whom are people who probably get tricked a lot. You're not a sucker, are you, sir? Heavens, no! As a public service, this video will help dispel the disinformation about one of the most widely misunderstood emails. First, let's read through it and examine the default bonehead distortion. ...of adding in the real temps for e to each series for the last 20 years, i.e. from 1981 onwards, and from 1961 for Keith to hide the decline. That seems like deliberately changing the data to suit your, suit your way. They talked about hiding the decline in temperatures of the last half of the last century. Mr. Jones talked to Mr. Mann about the trick of adding in the real temps to each series to hide the decline in temperature. Climate tricks used to hide the decline in temperatures. They found a trick to hide the decline in temperature data documented in climate studies. Like most Fox News talking points, there's much less here than all the heavy breathing would indicate. Scientists do know what they're doing, and a 15-minute primer on the internet doesn't make you a climate expert. The offending passage in this email is really in two parts. Phil Jones writes, I've just completed Mike's nature trick of adding in the real temps to each series for the last 20 years, i.e. from 1981 onwards. Who is Mike? And what's his trick? Mike is Michael Mann, one of the world's leading paleoclimate experts at Penn State University. Nature is the scientific journal where one of Dr. Mann's most notable papers was published. One of Dr. Mann's areas of expertise is in pulling together evidence of historic temperatures derived from natural markers like tree rings, ice cores, lake sediments, and corals. It was Dr. Mann's work on historic temperatures that formed the basis for the iconic symbol of the global warming debate, the hockey stick temperature graph. In putting together his first reconstructions, Dr. Mann knew that the data sets he was working with did not contain any information past the year 1980. His trick was to graph the data from natural markers up to 1980 and then overlay the actual instrumental temperature readings to carry the graph up to the current year. He carefully labeled all the elements of his graph. In his published papers, Dr. Mann directed readers to where the original paleo data to reproduce his results could be found online. That process is what Phil Jones was talking about in the first part of his email. It wasn't all that tricky, nothing was hidden, and there was no decline. 
The issue Jones was discussing in the email was a graph he was making for the cover of a World Meteorological Organization review of the year 1999. This was to be the cover illustration not for a scientific publication, but rather a glossy informational bulletin meant to summarize the best scientific understanding of historic temperatures. It was aimed at a non-specialist audience that Jones felt would be more interested in the real temps than the minutiae of a scientific paper. The next part of the email, which reads, and from 1961 for Keith's to hide the decline, is more complicated. Keith is Keith Briffa, a member of the Climate Research Unit staff and an acknowledged expert on dendrochronology, the art of teasing temperature data out of historic tree ring samples. Tree rings have been recognized and used as an indirect measure of temperature, so-called temperature proxies, for decades. For reasons not completely understood, certain data sets from northern and high altitude forests began to diverge from temperature signals around 1960. Possible mechanisms include increased carbon dioxide, rising temperatures, or changing rainfall patterns. The effect appears only for a very specific type of data called maximum late wood density. This divergence problem had been the subject of papers by several researchers, including Keith Briffa and his team, in this graph, Briffa showed how tree rings tracked with temperature over centuries, then diverged from actual thermometer readings around 1960. The obvious question that critics asked was, if tree rings are diverging from temperatures now, did they diverge in the past? And if so, are our temperature estimates accurate? Scientists answered that the other temperature markers all remain consistent in the past as well as in the modern era. In the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Third Assessment Report, published in 2001, Michael Mann's research figured prominently in the temperature reconstructions. Keith Briffa's team submitted tree ring data the green line here, ending at 1960 to reflect scientists' understanding of the well-known divergence from temperature and real thermometer data in red was overlaid on the curve. Thus, the report's authors, like Phil Jones, provided the real temps instead of the misleading and erroneous late wood density series. There have now been a half dozen official investigations of the non-event that Fox News, Glenn Beck, and others have framed as Climate Gate, including this one before the British House of Commons, which concluded, insofar as we have been able to consider accusations of dishonesty, we consider that there is no case to answer. The leading scientific journals were unanimous that there was no sinister scientific conspiracy. Major scientific societies, like the Geological Society of America and the American Meteorological Society, have reaffirmed that the science of climate change is sound, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science, as well as dozens of journalistic investigations, all agree that climate deniers' accusations have been misleading, immaterial, and deceptive. But climate scientists still aren't out of the woods. Over recent months, the denialist blogosphere has been abuzz with word of new criticism of the science from someone who appears to have scientific, if not climate science, credentials. And he's been making the rounds to ingratiate himself with the climate denial brain trust. Uh, he's a professor of the, uh, physics at UC Berkeley. He's the author of Physics for Future Presidents, Richard uh, Muller. Richard, how are you, sir? Physicist Richard Muller has inserted himself into the climate debate with a series of statements that have aroused the ire of informed experts and made him, at least briefly, the darling of the anti-science crowd. Knowing what you know now, 
watch this clip of a recent Mueller lecture and you decide what's wrong with this picture. What they did was, and there's a quote, a quote came out of the emails, these leaked emails, that said, let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. That's the words. Let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. Wait, we must have heard that wrong. Since Dr. Mueller prides himself on accuracy and precision, let's listen again. What they did was, and there's a quote, a quote came out of the emails, these leaked emails, that said, let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. That's the words. Let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. Really? Really? This is something that's really easy to check. Maybe he was just being sloppy on that particular day. Let's listen to a lecture from several months later. What they said is, how can we hide the decline? And the suggestion came back from Phil Jones at, in the UK, let's use Mike's trick to hide the decline. Dr. Muller is, by all accounts, not a stupid man. So it is curious that he would repeatedly misquote a key passage in such a way as to reinforce the most common denialist distortions. Certainly, that's the message that climate deniers have taken away. In addition to misquotes, Muller has also confused and conflated other key points. So some of the people who read these papers asked to see the data they refused to send it to them, the original raw data. Now this statement is puzzling because for the studies that Muller is referring to here, the raw data have been clearly available online for years, from at least 1999 for man's hockey stick data, and for Briffa's tree rings, at least since 2003. As Dr. Muller has become more visible, he has also announced the formation of a new project to assess global temperature rise, the so-called Berkeley Earth Surface Temperature Project. The acronym is BEST. Get it? In doing so, he has received funding from, among others, Bill Gates, as well as far right-wing industrialist and arch climate denier David Koch, an ominous sign to many scientists, but heartwarming for the anti-science community. Dr. Muller has been extravagant in his praise for leading climate deniers and promised his project would address all the time-worn hobby horses of the climate crank fringe. They're the skeptics who are really doing a good job and, and they have really raised issues that we are addressing. We're looking at the, at the uh, urban heat island effect, we're looking at the time of observation bias, we're looking at data selection bias, we're looking at all of these things. Muller's project received the ultimate blessing from the anti-science community when denialist high priest Anthony Watts commended the project and wrote, I'm prepared to accept whatever result they produce even if it proves my premise wrong. I'm taking this bold step because the method has promise. So let's not pay attention to the little yippers who want to tear it down before they even see the results. While deniers may have adopted Dr. Muller as one of their own, they might not have realized that he was pulling together a team of actual, strong-minded, professional scientists capable of following the evidence wherever it led. Robert Jacobson, uh, physicist. Uh, Robert Rohde, he's, he's, I had one act of genius in this project. Absolute genius. I'm so proud of myself. It was hiring Robert Rohde. The, he, he is, he's a true genius. <laughs> On March 31st, Dr. Muller testified before Congress on the preliminary results of his study. The mercurial Dr. Muller had some surprises for his adoring followers. Prior groups at NOAA and NASA in the UK estimate about 1.2 degrees Celsius land temperature rise from the early 1900s to the present. That 1.2 degree rise is what we call global warming. Their, their work is excellent, and uh, the Berkeley Earth Project strives to build on it. In our preliminary analysis of these stations, we found a warming trend that's shown in the figure. Uh, Berkeley Earth is the black curve. The other three groups are in color. 
Our result is very similar to that reported by the prior groups, a rise of about 0.7 degrees Celsius since 1957. This agreement with the prior analysis surprised us, uh, since our preliminary results don't yet address many of the known biases. When they do, it's possible that corrections could bring our current agreement into disagreement. Why such close agreement between our uncorrected data and their adjusted data? One possibility is that the systematic corrections applied by the other groups turn out to be small. We don't yet know. We will find out. Dr. Muller went on to specifically address the signature issue of Anthony Watts and his acolytes. Many temperature stations in the United States are located near buildings, in parking lots, or close to heat sources. Anthony Watts and his team have shown that most of the current stations in the U.S. Historical Climatology Network would be ranked poor by NOAA's own standards with error uncertainties up to 5 degrees Celsius. Did such poor station quality exaggerate the estimates of global warming? Berkeley Earth has studied this issue and we have a preliminary answer and the answer is no. Our analysis shows that over the past 50 years the poor stations in the U.S. network do not show greater warming than do the good stations. Thus, although poor station quality might affect absolute temperature does not, or, or variance in temperature, it doesn't uh, appear to affect trends. And for global warming estimates, it's the trend that's important. So in the blink of an eye, Dr. Richard Muller, the latest great hope of the anti-science world, held up the signature defining issues of the web's most famous and celebrated climate expert with a high school degree and shredded them. This guy peed on it. That lonesome wailing sound you hear is the little yippers of the climate denial community turning on their champion. This particular blog employs a time-honored tactic of publishing Dr. Muller's email address in the hopes that their significant audience of emotionally imbalanced readers will bombard Dr. Muller with threats, harassment, and intimidation. Time will tell if Dr. Muller's project will continue to reconfirm the overwhelming consensus of the world's expert climate community. If he does, he'll learn what Michael Mann, Keith Briffa, and Phil Jones already know, that those who pursue science and knowledge that does not serve the interests of the global fossil fuel industry will be singled out and punished. Whatever happens, remember, your most reliable and direct source of information will continue to be right here at Climate Denial Crock of the Week. <laughs>